Welcome to Hard Talk with me, Zainab Badawi. My guest is South African jazz legend and political activist Hugh Masekela. His life and music have reflected the struggles of the anti-apartheid era and then the years of black majority rule. So, why does he now describe South Africa as fast turning into a rubbish dump and becoming removed from its authentic African culture? Hugh Maskela, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you, thank you, Zeno. You were born in 1939 in Whitbank, about 100 miles east of Johannesburg. You said, if I have a trumpet, I won't bother anybody. You say music is your religion. Uh, no, well, you know, I, I was um, obsessed with, I was actually bewitched by music from infancy. And when I was five years old, I said, my parents to get me away from the gramophone um, uh, had me play the piano, they got me piano lessons, and like nine years later I saw a movie about a trumpet player, uh, a big spider big, uh, it was called Young Man with a Horn, and I had to play the trumpet. And In fact, it was a man of religion, uh, uh, Father uh, Trevor Huddleston, yeah, yeah, who he, gave you your first trumpet. He was the chaplain of my boarding school, St. Peter's uh, <clears throat> in, in Johannesburg. And he was interested in everybody. He knew my parents, he knew everybody's parents, and he was especially interested in restless people, which I was. And he just, I was uh, in bed with a cold, a bad flu, and he just said, what would, you, what would make you happy? Because I was always in trouble with the authorities anyway. And when you expelled in those days, there was no other chance for you. And I said, Father, if I can get a trumpet, I won't bother anybody anymore. I said, are you sure, creatures? And I'm positive. And with and his last 15 history, pounds. Right? Mm? The, uh, with his last 15 pounds. Yeah, uh, he sent me with a note to uh, the music store. Uh, he knew everybody, and Bob Hill was the manager of the store. as a Scotsman. He said, father is crazy. I think for the 15 pounds for a trumpet. But uh, he put in his own little money to do. Everybody really respected him. That one act of kindness, and of course he was a yeah. great anti-apartheid activist, wasn't he? And then um, he, got me, wasn't he got me a trumpet teacher. Mm. And uh, I'd already knew the rudiments of music as a piano player, so I learned so it very quickly. So we have Trevor Huddleston to thank for um, the, 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 your, your legions of fans throughout the decades for um, bringing us the, the, the work and music. Well, of I mean, he Masekela. was an amazing man in that uh, when he was deported from South Africa, where he fought apartheid um, harder than anybody at the time. Uh, he came over and he was just obsessed with the freedom of South Africa and he started yeah. the anti-apartheid movement when he came here. Sure. And uh, for 20 years he had uh, Trafalgar Square where South Africa House is occupied. Yes, yes. Well listen, let's just see a clip of you performing, um, uh, sadly not actually with your trumpet, but you're singing Stimella and yeah. this was at a venue in Johannesburg about uh, five years ago. Okay, should I watch? Yeah. Let's those special effects that you did there. So that's you singing <laughs> Stimella there, uh, swaying slightly in my seat, I, I, I was. And uh, you have been performing, of course, for five decades. Uh, you play the trumpet, the flugelhorn, the cornet, and you've been composing and, and singing. But it was a, a tough path to success for you, wasn't it? Um, well, yeah, very few people are successful at success, uh, especially <laughs> 
and in my business. I think to survive yourself is uh, one of the greatest successes of success in my profession. Mm. Your music is a kind of fusion of, of jazz with uh, uh, your traditional South African um, influences. And, and why I say it was tough for you, because of course, as apartheid began to advance, we found that uh, you know there were no music schools or music lessons really for black South Africans. And then a little bit later in the early 50s, there was the Bantu Education Act, which actually limited black South Africans to maybe just three hours schooling a day. Uh, that was really very difficult and you said you knew your place and never looked forward to getting anywhere in the world. It's tragic. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, in South Africa, and I think it was not only for an indigenous child, I think just if you're a, a humane person, it was against the law uh, in South Africa. But um, the paradox is that the greatest activity in music in South Africa happened during the apartheid era. That's when, like, the great Miriam Makeba and the Manhattan Brothers and the musical King Kong and great musicians came up out of that era, partly because the environment was very safe in that there were police coming out of the walls and the trees and everything. So it made the environment safer for um, uh, the entertainment business. The police were not there to protect mm. that, but mm. uh, uh, to, to perpetrate apartheid as much as possible. But it created, and that's when, that's when we all came up. So there was major, but there was never any music schools for Africans. You know, there was not uh, any uh, lessons. I, I learned, we learned, uh, myself and Jonas Gwango, my cousin, we came out of the Huddleston Band to play with professionals who were teenagers. And the people that we learned from were in their 30s and early 40s. And um, it was a hard time in that almost everybody I learned from died from booze. Yes, you mentioned booze because, of course, you were brought up by your grandmother who ran an illegal drinking den. People all around you were drinking, including you yourself. You started drinking at 14. 13. 13. Yeah. There you are. And, I mean, it is documented in your own autobiography, your, your struggle against alcoholism. I mean, you were arguably an alcoholic by the time you were 20, 21. And didn't know it because it was a respectable thing to be a great drinker. When, you know, when it was illegal, it was one of the biggest businesses, industries among Africans. And like Africa, South Africa is probably like the biggest drinking country in the world today because of that legacy. Mm. But if you were a great drinker, you got major respect. People took their heads off. Because it, it was a form of defiance. If your papers were right, you could walk up to a policeman and, and drunk as hell, as it, long as the, uh, the evidence was and say, would you like to see my papers? You know, but um, um, like I say, just about everybody I learned music from mm. died from, from booze. Mm. From on my mother's family side, except for my grandmother, my mother and her aunt, Everybody in my mother's family died from mm. booze. And yet you say that you, you, uh, even today, uh, drinking, you've said, is such a culture in South Africa that people don't realize what it's doing to them. Well, I mean, what? I don't know if you've ever seen the holiday statistics, like end of the year statistics mm. for, for, but people, more than 17,000 people die a year in, in road accidents mm. in South Africa. Mm. And, and you're quite outspoken, aren't you, as a critic of, of heavy drinking, obviously, well, because of your experiences. Everybody yeah. um, uh, is, because there's a major government uh, initiative called Arrive Alive, mm. although nobody listens to it, because, mm. because it's a habit. Uh, um, uh, um, mm. But people have to be, if they leave the house, they have to have a drink. I but mean, you've, most people... you've, battled, you've battled it and you've... Defeated your drink and, demons. I battled that and drug addiction because when I came to the States, it was a time of like a major, um, in the music business, a major uh, um, uh, drugging. And then when I moved to Los Angeles, mm. uh, it, it was the time of flower power and, so and, and, and uh, the free love generation. It was quite generation. a common pastime. Because you moved to the United States in, uh, around 1960, the early, early yeah. 60s, and you were helped by uh, friends Maria. in the international community like Yehudi Menuhin and so on. And then you married in the mid-60s, the great I late was, Mary McCabe. I was to the States by Mary Miriam Makeba and Harry mm. Belafonte. Mm. I had grown up with Miriam Makeba. You married her in the mid-60s? Yeah, we married in 1964 to 90s, and I produced a lot of her, her, her uh, records and, mm. and, and wrote quite a few songs for her, and we worked together 
for over 40 years on and off. And you enrolled at the Manhattan School of Music. You enjoyed the tutelage of Dizzy Gillespie, Louis Armstrong, and you developed, that's when you began developing your own unique style of Afro jazz. When I went to the States as a bebopper, you know, as a hell of a jazz musician, but everybody said, hey, you know, uh, you're just going to be a statistic if you came here for jazz, but we would like to hear some of your African stuff, you know. I was hoping to uh, play with the, uh, uh, Ad Blakey and the Jazz Messengers because Winton Marsalis came from there later, but Clifford Brown came from there, and Donald Byrd and Lee Morgan and Kenny Dorham and uh, Freddie Hubbard, all of the great mm. trumpet players and saxophonists came from there. But Ad Blakey said, man, form your own group. We want to hear some of that African stuff. And, and uh, Dizzy said the same, uh, you know, I mean, of course, Belafonte and Miriam, you know, said, mm -hmm. there's the only way you're going to get any notice, otherwise you're just going to be an outstanding people. So you think it was as a result of your exile, as it were, from South <laughs> Africa that you became the renowned musician that you are? No, I think that... Um, I, I, I've, I've just... I never looked for fame. You know, I wanted to be a sideman, I wanted to learn. I went to classical music school, you know, to learn so that I could come back to South mm. Africa and teach. Mm. But having been in the company of um, a major activists, uh, like Belafonte was the biggest fundraiser for the civil rights movement and were involved in all the fundraising. And I learned from him uh, more than anybody else that if you come from a people who are underfoot and uh, you get your juice from them, you know, then mm. if you don't talk about them, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> you said on uh, Channel 4 News here in the UK five years ago, I never, my music was never meant to be political or even campaigning. I just sought to connect. And yet we all know Hugh Masekela as an activist, an anti-apartheid voice, as much as you are a musician. Well, I came from an, from an activist community. You know, I have to realize that as children, we grew up in marches and boycotts and rallies. And um, I mean, we saw people like Nelson Mandela and them when they were in their 20s, you know, at rallies. And we grew up with it. There were more than 30 million people underfoot and everybody. I think that the biggest, the biggest uh, uh, um, uh, liberators for South Africa were all those people that are unknown that made South Africa ungovernable. And the ones who lost their lives, you know, when they're never mentioned. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, we grew up in an atmosphere of, like, uh, 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 protest. Sure. But you, you again, uh, in an interview in 2012, when you were asked what was the best experience of your career, you said returning home after 30 years of exile and having a second chance to start life in the arm of my folks has been great for me. But why did you, why were you away from South Africa for 30 years? Well, I couldn't go back to South Africa after 1964. Um, 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 but, you know, our passports were taken away, in fact. Um, sympathetic country. I traveled on a Guinean passport, then a Liberian passport. So it passport wasn't in any way self-imposed exile? You were not allowed back until yeah, 1990? No, um, my mother died in 1978 and my sister and I couldn't go and bury her. When so the Miriam, early, the earliest Miriam's you could go back. Miriam's mother died three months after she left South Africa, and she couldn't go okay. back to go. So and the bury. earliest you could go back was 1990, because we yeah. often hear about your self-imposed exile. You're saying yeah. that you could not have gone back before 1990. No, no. Okay. But I could have, but then I would have gone. To, you know, I, I, I mean, the government was so crazy by then that I could have gone right away to jail and who knows what else. And you thought that wasn't a risk worth taking. Well, I, you know, because there were in, many others who 19, went to jail and did go back. I'll tell you, in 1963, when I finished my studies, I said goodbye to Miriam and Harry, and I said I'm going back home. And I actually came um, here uh, to England on my way back home. And Harry called me because Miriam was very sick uh, in in hospital, and she said, and she said, you know, uh, before you go, just you know, come and. Uh, anyway, to make a long story short, Harry sat me down, and he said, look here, Hugh, um, when if you go back to South Africa now, nobody knows you in the upper echelons of the government, but all they know is that you've been hanging out with us and the things you've said, and you're gonna disappear. But if you stay here and make a name for yourself you can be able to talk about your country and gonna support for it. 
Okay, so you took, he did that advice. You went back in 1990 when the African National Congress, the ANC, was no longer banned. And then we saw, of course... Yeah, uh, all the political the, parties were, the, all the, yeah, yeah, were unbanned. Black then, majority yeah. rule yeah. came in in 1994. And, of course, we know Nelson Mandela with his, you know, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and, and extending his hand to, to South African whites. But you yourself said, I don't think I have the power to forgive white people. That's what you told the Observer newspaper here in 2012. Right. You still stand by that? You can't forgive Well, I people? mean, what powers do I have to, <laughs> to forgive anybody? I'm not a god. You but know? within your own self, do you not have the power to forgive white no, people? I mean, I think I have the right uh, to keep what I feel. You know, I couldn't be, I was not able to uh, go and bury my mother. And then I lost a lot of friends and relatives uh, who were in the struggle. But more than that, there's never been a time in the history of human beings where a uh, colonizing or occupational forces apologize and says, sorry that we took your land and we took all your minerals and like, we made all these billions off of your backs and we still have our business here, businesses there, but here's 500 trillion pounds to show you how sorry we are. So now, though, when you see students in, uh, for instance, uh, University of Cape Town removing the statue of Cecil Rhodes, yeah. you back them in that kind of, and it, and it was removed after it was, uh, you know, damaged, defaced? I think that, uh, uh, personally, I think that the issues uh, that should be dealt with is the fact that nothing much has changed in South Africa except that we vote. You know, but economically, we don't own the country as a people who were oppressed. We own less than 3% of land to start with. We don't own any of the businesses or any of the economy. There are few Africans in there who have been taken in to be part of the businesses, but they're dropping the ocean. And, uh, and that is the reality of the situation. You know, and that is so what I'm looking at. So you think economic apartheid still exists, whereby economic wealth in South Africa is still concentrated not only, not in the hands of, of is, white South Africans? Not only in community planning, and, and I mean, there's still architectural apartheid, there's town planning apartheid. Um, uh, it has never, in fact, I, may, I, I usually make a joke. I said, well, if we're going to legitimize everything, maybe we should like... And uh, also, instead of outlawing apartheid, we should really legitimize it because it's still in our midst. Mm. But, you know, uh, there are many, and I cite Trevor Manuel when he was a government minister in 2013. And, and you know, he says you can't undo all those decades of, of apartheid um, in, in a short space of time. It's just not possible. He says... Uh, you know, unless you're a magician, the legacy of apartheid runs too deep and too far to reverse in a short period. Yeah, well, I'm not a minister, you know. But do you agree with that sentiment that it's going to take more than 20 years to reverse? I don't, th I don't think that the onus is going to come from the, the administration. I think the will, the political industrial will has to come from those people who uh, monopolize the economy of South Africa. If the goodwill doesn't come from them, then it's just been a one-sided reconciliation. And what do you make of the record of the ANC 20 years in power? Because, of course, we know there are various studies. Well, every, every liberal is movement. The most you know, inequality yeah. is actually, has actually expanded under the ANC. Most, most liberation uh, movements are fantastic during liberation. But when it comes to governing, we always have to ask, you know, is, can, you, can you remember any liberation movement that has governed well? I don't remember any, mm. you know, because uh, um, it's, it's two different things. But then, you know, they, they inherit the, the power, and then from there you wait, you hope for the best. But so far, we haven't seen it in South Africa, not with Mandela, not with Mbeki, not with, you know, the present government. Is that why you said just this year we have crime, corruption, and a country, South Africa, that is fast turning into a rubbish dump? That's a very, very, the very strong language there. The strong language. Mm. Well, I think it's much worse than that, you know, because. If you're free and you can't walk around at night in your own country, then what's, what kind of freedom is it? a new constitution, people's human rights are, uh, you They're know, enshrined paper. constitutionally, paper is gay easy. rights and so yeah, on. it's all paper stuff, you know. It's a, there's gay rights, but like gay people have a rough time in the townships, you know.
So um, um, you can write stuff down and you can decree laws, but are they for real? I mean, you have problems here in England. You know, and England is like thousands of years old, but it has like its, its fair share of everything from xenophobia to poverty mm. to... Well, you mentioned xenophobia, and of course we all saw that very ugly face of actually mm. not xenophobia really, but Afrophobia, where mm. South Africans, black South Africans, turned on other Africans working in their midst, be yeah. they Nigerian, be they Somali, they trashed their properties and their businesses, and people were fearful for their lives. Yeah. What did you feel? Because, I mean, in fact, well, that song, it's, it's, that clip we played earlier on is about the migrant workers, and yeah. you remember migrant workers from well, it's Mozambique. A legacy, so it's a legacy of uh, uh, the Cecil Rhodes and the British colonialism that when they brought, originally when they brought non-South African, indigenous Africans to South Africa, they could only come in as uh, indentured servants or migrant labor, and uh, they were segregated from the South African uh, um, indigenous population. They lived in single men's hostels, and um, the audience—I mean, the, the the community was manipulated into thinking they were superior. So it's a very old thing. It comes from. So you blaming the old apartheid system and blame, white colonial rule? I blame colonialism for the attacks that we saw because uh, that I blame not colonialism for everybody. all chaos all over the world. You have said, in my view, Africa's real problems are cultural. In 20 years from now, when people ask my grandchildren who they are, they'll say it is rumoured that we used to be Africans long ago. So what do you mean by that? You feel that Africans themselves are denigrating their own culture or, or what? Well, I mean, you know, the conquest, the, the defeat of Africans throughout the years and uh, urbanisation, miseducation, politics and especially religion have made um, Africans really think that their own heritage is backward and primitive and savage and barbaric and heathen and pagan. In fact, the colonials don't have to do the job anymore. It's Africans that do it for them, you know, because basically Africans internationally don't have any idea of their history. And uh, my biggest interest is like to uh, create a situation where academies the new African mm. academies can uh, sprout up all over the world where we can really learn the true history of Africa, mm. the, the, the kingdoms, how, why we were fragmented. When it comes to music, you've also said uh, all that's new, considered new today, is electronic. There's no new music in South Africa. In Africa, period. I mean, Why, though? There's the, plenty of... The, the uh, people, the, the most... The most recognized African musicians internationally are those who come from heritage music. Maybe internationally, but that doesn't mean there aren't people who are sticking to their own traditions in their music, playing oh, yeah, on the no, continent, I mean, who are popular. You accept that? You accept that? Well, I mean, if you can give me an example. I'll give you an example. Zenzi Makeba, Miriam Makeba's daughter, Tandizwa Mazwe, works hard to stick to local music in, in South Africa. Just a couple of examples there. There are people who will sing in Zulu or whatever. It's oh, a yeah. sweeping yeah, statement But, you but they don't get played on the radio as much as the hip hop or the rap artists are, or the DJs. That's what has taken over. If yeah. you were going to sing, finally, a song for South Africa today, would it be a happy or a sad one, Hugh Masekela? Um, you know, I'm not regional, Zainab. I'm, I'm always trying to... Um, okay, for Africa. You know, would you sing a happy or a sad song for Africa? No, if, uh, if, 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 if I had to sing a song for Africa, it would be a song of wish, you know, and it would be Down With The Borders of 1886. That would be my song. Hugh Masakela, thank you very much indeed for coming on Hard Talk. I don't shake hands. you mind if I hug <laughs> yes, you? Yes, thank you. <laughs>